Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now I'm sitting here with John Rivenberg of Kerrville Hills Winery. Uh, we've known each other kind of casually on and off for quite a while. And this is the first time I've actually been able to kind of have a lot of time to sit down with him. So I'm super excited to talk with him. Uh, we're going to find out what he does and, and kind of where, where he's doing right now. And so, John, uh, after you get a little sip there <laughs> of, of, of that tasty adult beverage. Hello, B. God, I hate bees. Anyway, uh, it's a bee. It's not a wasp. That's, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, John, why don't you kind of tell us kind of how you got here? So, uh, yeah, I, um, through my 20s, I was probably one of the first guys in my group of guy friends that uh, was interested in wine. Um, I had some folks in my family that were interested in wine. So, um, I always kind of had a little love of wine. Uh, moving through my 20s, like, worked uh as a professional in the construction industry and um got an opportunity um to start a winery uh in 08 i started working on that winery project in 08 we opened up in 10 2010 uh to the public um 2015 i um left that uh left that winery and started consulting um, and in that time, since 2015, I have, um, helped been a brand builder, um, a, uh, winemaking consultant, a wine mentor, um, and most recently, um, a, um, educator. Uh, we started an incubator in 2020, uh, out of our winery, Curva Hills Winery. Um, and it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, along that ride, I've been, uh, a board member of both uh, Twiga, Texas Wine and Grape Grower Association. I've sat on our um, uh, Texas Department of Agriculture's uh, Wine Advisory Council for several years. Um, and what I've been most happy about, and what we're here today for, is Hill Country Winery uh, Association. This is my second stint as president uh, of the organization. Um, and uh, yeah, here we are, back in person, um, bringing Texas wine to people. Cool. So, so you might have heard a little bit of wind noise. We are sitting outside. It's not that windy here. Hopefully my magic, the mega purple, will we'll, we'll get rid of that. <laughs> anyway, that's a lot right there. That's a lot. That's a lot. I've done a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've been around the world a few times. Yes. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm hopefully going to Twiga. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people about that. Anyway, right. um, so kind of talk about, uh, let's focus with, I guess, Kerrville Hills and what you're doing there and uh, how you're serving as an incubator. Yeah, so the the goal behind Kerrville Hills was kind of uh, organically developed. Um, you know, we, uh, we we bought the winery in 2019. The goal was to navigate the winery, rebrand it, and just operate a winery, right? Um, and in 2020, obviously, we all know what happened at the beginning of 2020, yeah. the world starts to shut down. And, but a very interesting, a very interesting thing happened. My, my phone didn't stop ringing. It started ringing more. And more people wanted to start wineries. More people wanted to be mentored. More people um, were not necessarily thrilled with other situations they were in and wanted to do something different because they wanted more of that hands-on um, mentorship involved with their development of their wineries. And so we um, started to actively work towards doing what I have wanted to do for the last decade of my life, which was build an incubator. Um, I fell in love with the incubator in Walla Walla, Washington uh, at a visit 10 years ago or so. And uh, I just thought it's, it was such a cool concept, right? Winemakers working collaboratively with each other to both inspire and educate um, and, and uh, bolster each other. Right. Um, and so we've been now producing um, about the equivalent of about 25,000 cases a year. Okay. Now the last two vintages um, at, uh, at Kerbal Hills. Um, everybody that's part of the incubator is required to, to work. So we're, we're not a custom crush. Like, okay. I, I want to be very, very clear. Yeah, I couldn't call you and say, hey, man, I want, I want like a winery called, I want a wine called Mark's Wine and you do all the work. No. Yeah. Okay. No. That's cool. You because could, we we could we could maybe help you with some of the components of that, but we yeah. would we would expect you to be uh, intimately involved, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we do most everything we do through relationship, right? Uh, we have some folks that we do some little one-off projects like that with for, but they generally are people who have their own operations, they have their own things going, and they just need a helping hand for this one project. Right? Okay. 
Um, but we are we are most definitely not custom crush. So everybody uh, that is entered into the wine making program, the incubator program, has a representative from their business that works with us directly at the winery during harvest, during bottling, during daily operations. Um, and so we we truly are, um, you know, uh, a think tank for wines. Um, sometimes we call it the Amish barn raising of winemaking because <laughs> you may have four different winemakers from four different brands all working on each other's wines simultaneously. Okay. And it, and it just, the, the intellectual uh, spark that is generated is so cool to watch. Okay. It's just, it's just, it's just great. Right. Um, and that's kind of in a nutshell what we do. I mean, it's not right. much more difficult than that. That's, that's what it is. So um, sourcing for, for the wines, where, where are the grapes coming from? Is it stuff that you have or you? So we source from, uh, we source from 42 different vineyards. Okay. Um, this last year we did a little over 350 tons. Um, 42 vineyards, 39 wine varietals, and 106 different wine lots. Okay. So we source from uh, Hill Country Vineyards that we manage, uh, Hill Country Vineyards that we contract with, um, and High Plains Vineyards that we navigate as well. Okay. Cool. Um, and how many... How many people are you working with right now as far as like the wines or um, I guess? We are, we're right around uh, 10 or 11. Okay. Yeah. There, there's some that are kind of in, in ebb and flow. We've got some people that are, we've got some people that are kind of leaving the nest and we've got some people that are coming into the nest at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. so what is, um, do you have uh, kind of a general idea about how long someone's going to stay in the nest before they kind of, they kind of go and fly for themselves? So, so our commitments are based around three-year cycles. Okay. Um, you know, you, you really kind of need, you know, to work through our – and I hate saying work through our program because it makes it sound like we're like some kind of infomercial, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not what it is. But in wines, you work in three-year cyclical cycles, right? Okay, yeah. Like, nothing just you, – you know, you don't just do everything in one year. It doesn't work that way. And so I've just kind of found that, that three-year um, increments um, is kind of the best to learn – because you get you at the very least in three years, you can learn from beginning to end what the process looks like. Right? Okay. On average, most people are five to six. Okay. Um, and you know, some people, we've got some folks that are looking at they they may never go. They we, they may be a partner forever. You know. Yeah. Um, Is that because they're maybe their operations a little too small to have like their own like their own brick and mortar type of thing? Um. I, I, honestly, it's actually the other that their brands have become successful enough to where they realize very quickly that they're going to always need to be part of our kind of Amish barn raising. And it, and it makes operational sense for what they're doing to grow their brands, to keep that uh, that foundation in place to of help. Right? OK, um, because we again, we're not a custom crush, but we are very much a family or community and we're kind of we're always there. You never really leave the incubator, right? Right. Uh, it's kind of like it's kind of like the mafia, right? You never really leave the mafia. <laughs> you know, you're always involved. And 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 two, like we're we have a we have a family mentality that we are definitely stronger in numbers, right? Our buying power is better. You know, our our networking abilities are better, um, and uh, it it just it just works well, right? So, you know, as we build this community. We have our own little wine community that that we lean on each other, and it's it's nice. All right, cool. Yeah, so people can stay, just do nothing else to help mentor others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's very cool. And you got like thirty nine. You said like thirty nine different varieties that, that came in. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that a, a lot of that going into like blends? Is it going into single variety wines? I mean, I'm, um, it, it's all everything. The above. It's yeah, everything. it's everything. Yeah. I mean, there are, you know, I'm a big proponent of uh single varietal wines okay um but i also love blends right yeah um and so i think everybody kind of learns the nuances of of both activities right um so i wouldn't say i couldn't say honestly that we are focused one way and or the other we're focused on making the best wine okay and if the best wine is a single varietal that's what we're going to do if the best wine is a blend of a couple of varieties then that's what we're going to do. All right. Um, so besides, you know, the 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 mass resignation of, of COVID and people wanting to to be crazy enough to to get into a winery, uh, what other challenges have you had maybe the past couple of years with with the incubators? I mean, you know, like everybody, and I hate to use a buzzword. I mean, staffing. 
staffing's been inter- interesting. Um, but where we have the challenge of staffing, we have the benefit of incubator members being part of what we do. Right. So okay. everybody's kind of got a vested interest in everybody doing well. Mm-hmm. So that's that's been a nice little safety net that we've had. Um, uh, you know, general challenges of like every winery that starts to see some successes, space. Yeah. You know, um, and availability of, of access to uh, growth capital and those kind of things. But, um, you know, I, I got to say, I mean, uh, we've been very lucky. Like we've we've worked real hard to kind of mitigate a lot of the things that stumble wineries. And after 15 years of doing this, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on right. on being able to dodge those bullets. And again, when you have a really good team and a really good family, right. um, it seems to work well. Like we built a great winemaking team this year. So I'm super excited. Right now, our front of the house team is a little is a, is a little less than. Um, we need a good tasting room manager for our two tasting rooms to okay. help with that. Um, but our senior management staff is fantastic. Our winemaking staff is fantastic. And now that we're starting our vineyard uh, co-op and vineyard incubation program, that side is legit too. I think you just sat in Shara's. Sure did. Lecture. Shara, I've been toward Shara, and she's now. You know, she's our, our senior vineyard project manager for what we're doing. And yeah, you know, yeah, we've got we've got a good team. Yeah. So right before I uh, sat down with John, uh, I decided to if you've been watching my Freestyle Friday videos and all the um, agricultural stuff uh, and about conventional farming, organic and all that. I wanted to sit in on a little seminar about herbicides and weed control. Um, and while probably a lot of it was over my head in the sense of, you know, the throwing out names of chemicals that I don't really know, um, the, the concepts um, made sense. Um, and I learned a little bit more about um, effective use and responsible use also of these chemicals because they, you know, learning about compliance and record keeping and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, I mean, I still only know maybe that much more than I did before, but I feel a little more confident that I understand that concept a little bit better. So that was, and, and so kind of to, to speak to why I'm, I'm here, it's not only to interview people like John, it's also to meet other people and also to learn more. While that doesn't necessarily help my wine reviews or necessarily help me gain a new fancy shiny pin from an organization, I think it helps me <laughs> connect the dots with wine and helps me in my day-to-day life. Um, also helps me kind of talk on a same level um, with the people who make the wine and grow grow the grapes. Um, so that was a very interesting uh, seminar. I was really happy to be able to do that. Um, and I, I popped in at the very end of one of the other seminars and they were, they were talking about challenges. Uh, and they did talk about labor was yeah. definitely one of them. Um, they also talked about sourcing, but you've got so many years that I, you're, yeah, you're we- probably pretty good with we're with pretty sourcing, good. Yeah. yeah, we're pretty good. I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed to have built a reputation that lends our lends um, a certain amount of access that yeah. other people may not have. I mean, there's a few of us in the in the industry, um, and it's nice that we all work really well with each other. So, you know, one colleague may have access to another place, and I may have access to something else. And we're, we're really good about helping each other cover programs and things like that. And so, um, I, I think we're very blessed that people want to get wines in the hands of myself and other people that are working with me. Um, there's always going to be the challenges in Texas of supply chain, right? With, right. with grapes. Uh, it's always going to be an issue. Um, until we really hammer down on our commercial farming, it's always going to be something that we struggle with. Yeah. Um, but you're right. We don't have near the challenges that a lot of the, the smaller wineries or startup, startup operations have. Yeah. Especially if, you know, you're, you're brand new and you're wanting 100% Texas grapes. It's going to be difficult um, to to adhere to that. Yeah. Um, you might be able to do 75% and import the other 25 and still use Texas. But that's changing soon. What's well, changing dramatically for yeah. a couple of reasons. One, we worked real hard this last year on some, uh, some le- legislation that changed the uh, nomenclature appropriateness for 100% Texas wines. Um, but something you touched on that I, I hold near and dear is that everybody involved with the incubator has to be a hundred percent Texas wine. We don't do, we do no outside the state fruit. Um, I've made wine all over. I yeah. have no problem with wines outside the state. 
but we're Texas and I want to teach people how you can navigate 100% Texas wines and do it appropriately, correctly, and without any hiccups having to cause you to go elsewhere, right? So we're building, we're building bridges over vintages. Um, we're building bridges over styles and I'm just, I'm teaching people the, 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 the tips and tricks and techniques that I've learned over the years to help me navigate around those shortages and shortcomings okay. uh, that can be our farming at times. Yeah. So maybe you have a multi-vintage wine if you're having, yeah. if you have, so like, uh, so like last year with, with, you know, the snow, so, so whatever, the big snowstorm that you had all over, <laughs> all over yeah. Texas and lots of people had no power including myself for a few days. Um, how did that affect, say, the vines in the two major areas in the high plains and here in the hill country? I mean, I think for the most part, we always expect a certain amount of percentage of loss. I, I, I've just come to that point in my career where there is, I, I'm going to plan for X, but I know we're going to get Y, right? Okay. Um, and Y may be a deficit. Why may be a, uh, you know an increase, mm -hmm. right? It's not always a negative. Um, and so this freeze last year, it, as far as tonnage wise, it, it didn't really slow us down. A couple reasons. One, we watch very closely what's happening in the market. Um, you know, my buddy Chris Brundrett said earlier today, being in the vineyard, being being with your growers, being a around what's happening on a regular basis helps you be involved in your anticipation for what shortcomings could come, right? Okay. Or a shortcoming could come in the form of like too much fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is also equally as daunting sometimes to have to order 20 tons and get 85, you know? Because you have nowhere to put it. Because you have nowhere to put it, <laughs> yeah. And so we um, we worked real closely as, as the snow apocalypse was going on. We had no power. We had no water, but we were like in talks with the people that we could be in talks with as those yeah. things were happening. But also at the same time, like for us in the Hill Country, um, the way that storm hit, it, it really, um, you know, the ice encapsulated the vines. And then we had the hard, hard, cold temperatures, which they, you know, where they were quasi protected by that, that mm -hmm. frost. Now, did we see some reduction in crops? Yes. Was it apocalyptic? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Um, so we just knowing that, you know, okay, we know we're going to be down. We're going to call it, we'll tag a number. We're going to be down 25%. Let's start looking, you know, where other people, I think, rest on their heels. Right. We don't. And and as a group, we work real hard to make sure that we all are doing. I kind of work real hard to teach everybody that I work with that when you see these things, don't wait till April to call somebody. Yeah. Call them in February. Home now. Yeah. Like you need to be, we need to be doing this now. So, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of setback because okay. of this year. And that's not going to affect really much this year or is, cause I know that sometimes say like a, something happens in the winter may not affect that vintage, but it could affect a, a following vintage. Yeah. And, and we've actually, we've already been actively cutting buds in vineyards. We've already, we've been actively looking at, uh, vineyard stock. And so far, I mean, things have looked, things are looking really great. My biggest fear right now, honestly, is we've had, we're having, we're, it's January. Yeah. All right. And, it's and the 70. vines aren't going dormant, right? Well, they're dormant, but, but it, but they're not, the disease pressure, um, we've had very mild winter, very little water. Um, and so I'm worried about soil temperatures on the ground, how quickly they're going to wake up, you know, okay. that, that kind of thing. So, so if they wake up too soon, you might get hit with a frost, Yep. Exactly. you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah I, see, like I go to these seminars to learn these things because I can talk intelligently a little bit. <laughs> um, this doesn't help me in selling wine in my day job or anywhere else, but yeah. Um, yes, it does. It does. If, if, yes, it if does. I have customers that, that really want to go down the rabbit hole, I'll go down the rabbit hole with them. I try not to have them sink in the rabbit hole with that, me, but. <laughs> that, I get that too, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. So, um, so for now we, we seem to be pretty good. Yeah. Do, do you see a lot of expansion in vineyards coming online over the next few years? Um, yeah. I mean, if I have anything to do with it, we're working diligently to put as much acreage in, in the hill country. And then if we can some more in the high plains in the next few years, okay. I, I'm, my goal is to, my goal for the next 10 years is to 
keep my foot on the gas to put as much vineyard in operation as I can in the hill country first, mm-hmm. and then it, in and where it makes sense appropriately in the high plains as well. Okay. Now, are there varieties you're focusing on for the hill country? Um, I mean, to not, to not, yes, I mean, to not. I can't. You know, it'll always be. There'll always be to not. Um, but you know, I think our signature grape for Texas is diversity, right? Okay. A- a- and diversity, as you know, is not an actual grape. I think the fact that we can grow so many different varietals is kind of what our identity is. Um, and so I love to not, I love people Blanc. We've been farming grapes um, uh, with Ab Asterisk to Claire Blanc is fantastic. Okay. It's been absolutely phenomenal to work with, phenomenal to grow. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited about, I'm excited about Sagrantino. Uh, I'd like to put some Toraldigo in the hill country. Um, we've been making fantastic Tyrol to go out of the high plains for a few vintages now. Um, I, I've been working with some hot weather clones from like Southern Italy. Okay. Uh, we're putting a bunch of those in, in now production blocks, um, this coming year of Cabernet Sauvignon in Southern Italy. So it goes against counterintuitive what people think of cab, right? Right. Yeah. There's no clone seven. There's no clone nine. I mean, it's, it's. Hot weather stuff. No clone three three seven. I've been growing three three seven for a long time. Okay, so and, and go back to history. That's actually where I came up with the thirteen thirty seven wine. Well, thing. I was going to ask you that, yes. but I wasn't sure. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, when you said that, I was like, he's talking about clone three three seven. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So brief history lesson to everybody. Uh, if you weren't watching back in two thousand nine. I came up with the idea of calling this thing thirteen thirty seven wine. It actually was the idea was a website and make a wine out of it. That was because I saw the Noble Vines, which I've reviewed three times on the show. Uh, Noble Vines 337, I thought someone had a label that said 1337 because I looked at the label little angle. So I thought somebody made a wine for geeks that like wine. No, for wine geeks. There was the explanation. That's why I had ah. to change the name because 1337 means elite. That's short for elite and gamer and hacker speak. So now you know why I said enough of this banging my head against the, the door of the wall of explaining why my show was named what it was and just call it Wine World TV and it's so much easier. <laughs> and when you came to, clicked on it, you probably wouldn't have clicked on it if it said 1337 Wine unless you're a geek and then you thought I'd be reviewing Elite. Or I'm, and I'm not saying that John's not part of the Elite uh, or the, the, the not elite like snooty elite, but like, you know, like OGs and like some of the pioneers of Texas wine, because he is. But the fact that I was at the time reviewing $10 bottles of wine was kind of the inside joke. That's cool. Well, if you ever <laughs> if you ever want to make your way um, out to the winery, we have probably, I guarantee, well, not probably, I can pretty much guarantee you, we have the most amount of cab, individual cab clone, warm weather expressions that you can come and taste, including some 337 vineyards that are a little older now that make, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. Neil Newsom, I, I'm convinced that he's got cab 337. It's the one that we won the first double gold with out of his vineyard and his cab. It, it, the expressions are, are absolutely amazing. There's a vineyard called Family. Um, and they they have 337 and it's they, great, right? Yeah. Um, we couldn't get 337 this year, but I also wanted to try this other this other clone as well. So, okay. yeah, that's cool that I didn't realize that you were, yeah. Yeah. Not a lot um, of people know that. That Yeah, again, that's, that's me being a geek. <laughs> um, so besides Hill Country and Texas High Plains, are there any areas in Texas that you think have some really good future and what, what they can maybe grow? Oh, shoot. There's, I mean, we have so many untapped areas that can grow grapes. The whole area from like Mason to San Angelo. Okay. I mean, you've got millions of square miles that haven't even been tapped because they're just so far out in the middle of nowhere. Like Mason, San Saba, Menard, um, you know, Junction, um, uh, you know, all the way up to Fort Stockton. And then you get into the lower southwest of like all the stuff around Fort Davis and Davis Mountains. They, yeah. We have so many places that can grow grow grapes. Um I mean, the hill country is, you know, tiny, right? Um, we've got great vineyards all in those areas. I think the central part of the state, I think there's some, I think some people are missing 
missing some things in that, like, uh, the only other way to know to call it is the I-35 corridor that, you know, Waco, mm-hmm. Burleson, you know, I think if they, like, look at some farming ideas, they've got some great soils, they've got some, they're in a good weather band, you know, uh, protected weather band. Um, and then again, I think the guys down on the Gulf Coast, there's been a lot of really interesting varietals grown down there as well. So yeah. we're the, the sky's wide open for what you can do in Texas. I mean, okay. we've, we've only scratched the surface in the last 35 years of where you can actually grow grapes here. And, and that's talking with a lot of people. I, I get I get that. Um, you know, I know some people that got some stuff out in the, in the Davis Mountains. You know, some a little bit cooler climate, or or because of higher elevation, they they can yeah. they can do some cooler climate stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, well, it's one of our partners. I mean, one of our partners is uh, uh, Pamela and Steve Yoder and their son Zach. Um, they are at forty five hundred feet in elevation. They're in Dalhart, Texas, which is like the very tip corner of the Panhandle. Mm-hmm. Um, they're closer to New Mexico and uh, Colorado and Oklahoma than they are to Austin, Texas, to our capital, right? Yeah. And um, they're growing Pinot Meunier, Gewurztraminer, Gruner Vettliner, uh, Cabernet Roussan, um, uh, Pinot Noir, and they're, it's cold, it's high in elevation, it's dry. Mm-hmm. Um, their, their climate is so perfect and so could not be so more polar opposite of what we have in the hill country. Like, I'm just tickled to death to be working with those vines right yeah because it's completely different expressions than what we have down here so being out there um or just the high plains in general uh, um you're having less disease pressure in general than you would here in general here? Yeah, yeah 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 in general i would say definitely i mean this last year there was a lot of rain in the high plains and so yeah, that's they what saw, i heard in that seminar they saw, yeah they saw d- disease pressures that they hadn't seen in the past um but I, as a rule very little pressure there was um it wasn't the summer i just did but the summer before chris chris and seth and michael McClendon. michael yeah michael yep um who i've got to sit down with michael michael's um, a good dude anyway they were talking about there's something i guess there's some type is it a, is it a is it a, a is it a pest or is it a disease that's hitting the high plains that they don't normally see i forgot the name of it um, I mean, there's lots of things that have been. No, yeah, but there was something that was like, unusual. I don't know. I, I should have. I meant to ask them about it, but probably, I probably they're, talk to they're them. probably talking about dicamba, which is that's it. What yeah, is so dicamba? Di- dicamba? I don't know what that dicamba is. is an herbicide that's generally sprayed by by cotton farmers, peanut farmers. Okay, so and they're worried so about it's, drift. It's drift. Yeah, got it. Yeah, which then that was made sense because in the seminar I would talk, I went in. They talked about drift and having your ducks in a row with your paperwork so yep. you can show yes or no what the wind was how the wind was and yep. all that like yeah okay that can but and i remember something along those lines a couple of years ago sitting in a very similar uh mm-hmm. seminar and a lot of the high plains yep. farmers were there um, started, talking about that i started talking about 2,4-d damage back in 2012 and 2013 oh uh, that okay and okay now okay i saw that in the san antonio paper about it and but i saw it like it's in the in the in the seminar stuff i saw 2,4-d that's yep, so i didn't know what yep. that was okay 2,4-d and dicamba both are uh very noxious herbicides that okay. will they will volatize into the air drift and then whether it's you know, humidity or dew point, they're they're unvolatized and they drop into a vineyard. And when they drop into the vineyard, it's basically like the vineyard's getting sprayed with right. these herbicides. Which is an herbicide we probably wouldn't use in a vineyard. Yeah. You um, could, but not. But you could, but it would not be a good idea. Yeah, it's there's not. Others more, there's others that are there's others that are better. They're less volatile. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely better better herbicides out there yeah. than that. Yeah. Okay. You but not, it's cheap. I yeah. mean, it's honestly, yeah. I mean, a lot of farmers. And it's use very it effective for it's cotton cheap. farmers. Yeah, it's very effective for cotton farmers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not not to not to get into like in a lot of inside baseball stuff, but <laughs> um, but yes, this reality of winemaking is that the vast majority, like ninety five percent of the world, is conventionally farmed or is not certified organic. Let's put it that way. They might be might be more like ninety three percent is conventionally farmed, but um, and that's the reality of of what's going on. But I know that talking with a lot of people like you and other farmers. Um, that the amount of herbicides, pesticides, and all the sides they, they use is as minimal as possible because especially some of the people like Neil who live on the property yeah. don't want to get sick, you yeah. know? Yeah, So It's um, bad. I mean, it, it, it really is bad stuff. I mean, we work real hard down here to um, 
implement best practices for our herbicide. Um, you know, a little bit of a scruffy vineyard. A lot of times herbicides are sprayed. You know, as vineyard gets older, man, people are spraying them for um, for visual effect, man. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but yeah. as the vineyard gets older, you don't have to spray as much herbicide as people think, right? At least timing-wise, right? Like you, mm. you, certain times of the growing cycle, you don't want the amount of pressure from, from weeds. But if your vineyard's 10 years old, your root system is far deeper and far more complex and developed than the root systems of a six inch grass. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the fact that you just wipe that out and create a monoculture, in my opinion, is not the most, is not the most proactive way to, to navigate things. Well, yeah, I definitely agree. I think there should be some type of polyculture in the vineyard. I mean, a vineyard is a monoculture by definition, but if you've got your cover crops, uh, if you have, if you let some weeds hang around here and there, it may not be a bad thing. Um, you need some competition uh, in the vineyard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's all the, all those research hours I put in to the, uh, to the farming practices really drove home the fact that um, there's, it's good to have a little bit of competition mm -hmm. um, and not have necessarily a, mon a true monoculture of it things. Is. It is. So yeah. Um, I think we've kind of covered a good amount of stuff here. Is there anything that maybe I didn't touch upon that, that you want to talk about? Um, you know, I, I guess probably for me, the biggest, the biggest thing is that, um, you know, letting, letting the world of wines understand, um, how much work we're actually putting into legitimate farming, mm -hmm. legitimate winemaking. Um, and, I guess what to fold over that is become apparent is the rest of the world seems to be catching on. And I, and I, I'd like that. I, I, I like that people are starting to catch on to Texas wines and they're taking us seriously. And I, I think that they're taking us seriously because we're finally taking ourselves seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's just how we, that's how we're going to be. You know, I can say that over the years, I mean, I moved back in 2008 and I'm visiting the hill country more than anywhere else uh every year or two i'd pop up here and seeing just the the explosion of wineries but talking to a lot of the people who are are newer to the wine business to the winery business that they're serious about it they're not they're not trying to make they're not trying to make the ten dollar supermarket wine no um granted some of the stuff is like very small production so they're not going to sell it for ten dollars a bottle but they're trying to be 100% Texas yeah. in their in their grapes. They're they're relying on people like you to help mentor them because they want to make serious world class wine, not just wine that they can just throw out there on the 290 wine trail just yeah. to grab some tourists and grab some grab some cash real quick. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that maybe some of them don't do that. But I, there's a lot of them, I think, that are being taking things a little more seriously. Yeah, um, and it's good. I, and I would engage. I, I, I would engage the consumer to to revisit Texas wines. Mm -hmm. Right. There are a lot of people that know wines that ten years ago they they experienced Texas wines, and they they were lackluster. Right. And I think a lot of times the wines that that our everyday consumer is uh, exposed to aren't necessarily always our uh, our best wines. Just like any region you go to, mm -hmm. right? You can go to Napa. You can go anywhere in the world that has great wines. There are the brands that everybody thinks is the flagship. And then you go other places and you go, oh, my gosh. Wow, this is yeah. this is really great, right? There's some other standout things. And so I would I would challenge the consumer to to re-engage themselves with Texas wines, right? Okay. Um, and And – Look outside of, uh, look outside the grocery store, right? Um, and 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 get out and experience what is Texas wines because it's great. I yeah. mean, it's it's for nothing else. Our wines now match our hospitality, and it's worth making the trip out here to the hill country. Yeah, yeah. It's worth making the trip up to the high plains and tasting. You know, the, they've got wineries up there now. They do. Too. Yeah. Um, you know. East Texas has them. North Texas has them. Yeah. Um, I am a little biased. I do think we are the flagship. You know, I think we are. I, the... I believe. I believe it is. I mean, and I, I know people that have got their wineries out in East Texas and 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 West Texas, and I consider them friends. Um, but and they make wonderful wines. But this is this still is the crown jewel of the state, and this yeah. is why you know the 290 Trail exists, and why you know 
whatever ranking we are compared to the rest of the wine world as far as visitation, <laughs> yeah. uh, like second or whatever. Um, but there's a reason for it, you know. Um, and I and I think that and it was touched upon a little bit in, in the the, the uh, seminar that Chris and uh, Michael and uh, Seth are in that um, one of the problems, and I think it's been a problem for, for so, so long, is the distribution of wine outside the wineries kind of hurts because when someone goes to your winery, maybe not yours specifically, but goes to the winery, has some really cool wines, and then they buy whatever, and then they go visit their local wine shop, and it's not there, then they then it's kind of disappointing because, and it doesn't mean that people in on that side of the industry don't want to sell those wines, mm -hmm. You just can't get them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Especially in the retail side. On the restaurant side, it's a little bit easier because you're not having to make huge case commitments to a chain. Yep. Um, unless there's a large chain of restaurants, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, it's, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is getting the higher quality wine out side of the winery yeah i mean it's navigating price point is yeah. really what it all i mean at the end of the day it all boils down to navigating price point and we it still costs more money to make wines here and if you're mm -hmm. going to make a really nice wine it it's not going to be eight bucks to sell to a to a, a retailer um, no it's not and 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 that is that's a difficult thing right mm -hmm. and I, you, you can't fault the retailer for wanting to make uh you know money and you can't fault a restaurant for wanting to make money um, but that's exactly the chicken and an egg, right? We can't, we can't sell anything outside for the, uh, margins that need to be sold for. Yeah. Need to be sold for. That was, um, few, quite a few months ago. I, I did a whole breakdown on why a wine costs what it costs. Of course, I don't oh. have every single little piece of information. I had to make a lot of guesses, but the bottom line was the more expensive the grapes, the more expensive the, the wine. And then you add in things like oak and all that kind of stuff. But then I also d discuss how you make a $10 bottle of wine, you know, having massive amounts, economies of scale, um, oak chips or oak powder and mega purple and all that kind of fun stuff to help stretch things out. And that also talking about how the fact that once you put wine in distribution, the winery makes less profit. You get, you get the maximum profit of selling directly to the consumer. Um, but if you have a massive amount of wine, yeah. And, and, and popularity is a double-edged sword. Yeah. Too. I mean, because then you start to make decisions based around your distribution team, your marketing team, your sales team, your winemaking team, in my experience, with working with and around wineries that are larger and in a whole lot of uh, wholesale distribution, is the, the winemaking team and the vineyard team end up being the last ones uh, you know, brought in on the conversation <laughs> and it, that's just should be the other way around. Yeah. Right. And you know, well, they're the ones supplying it. They're the ones supplying <laughs> it, but yeah. we'll get there. I mean, it, like, yeah. look, uh, California can sell fantastic wines mm -hmm. and distribution. Right. So there's ways of doing it. It's just creating that economy of scale that works. I mean, yeah. we've got, I've got friends that are building brands that will be, you know, in the hundred thousand, 200,000 case range in the next 10 years. And a huge amount of that will be in distribution and yeah. they'll become the more, you know, the, you know, my goal was to have a great work life balance, uh, make high quality wines and, uh, right, wrong or indifferent. We're going more towards the build multiple brands of cult quality and, uh, interest. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, nothing wrong no, with that. There's I, plenty of wines around the world that, that are not hundred thousand case wines Yeah, and they're oh, wonderful. I, and yeah. I have no desire to be a hundred thousand case winery. <laughs> I have no desire to have a winery, but if, yeah. if I was, it would not be 100,000 case winery. Absolutely. All right, John. Um, yeah, I think uh, we can go ahead and wrap all this up. Um, it's been wonderful having Thank you. No, it's been wonderful talking to you, little man. chat. Um, folks, as always, uh, click like, hit subscribe, tell your friends about it. This is the best way to increase, uh, best way to, to help out the channel uh, grow. Um, fun little fact, it, it's, it seems, doesn't seem like a lot. But um, I almost hit the semi goal, the, the the true goal I had for subscribers by December 31st. I was by, I was off by two. Oh. We had a, I had tried to do a big push at the end, um, but I'm now past its 450 subscriber mark. It doesn't sound like a lot. It's not. But considering when this version of the channel started, I had almost 200 less subscribers. Any business would take that increase in volume. Um, so I'm expecting us to get to the thousand mark by the end of the year. And then that just means I 
hit, hopefully hit a critical mass. That's awesome. Man. Um, anyway, uh, so keep spreading the word out. I uh, really appreciate everybody who watches my stuff and uh, expect more and really cool stuff coming. Uh, I'm gonna take this moment to say, the Freestyle Fridays, you might, may not see a few for a while. Actually, maybe one, maybe two more. Uh, there'll be a little hiatus because I'm all in on Psalm School Advanced. Um, the Monday episodes, I got all the way through, through the middle of March, so that's good, but the channel itself may take a little of a hiatus for about two months while I uh, work on the other project and get all that going up and running because that's uh, what's my future on the certification side. All right, uh, that's gonna do it. Um, again, click like, subscribe, tell your friends, and uh, we'll see what we're guessing. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. All right.